So the completeness axiom was our first way of getting at the, the identity, the origin, if you like, of the, rash, of the real numbers from the rationals. But it wasn't the only way. The other way that came up during the mock trial for how we might define a number like 0.9999999 repeating. The other way was to say, well, let's just think of it. So what we decided was that not only could we define the reals as the suprema of sets of rationals, according to the completeness axiom, but we also, during the mock trial, convinced ourselves that another way to represent 0.9 repeating was as the iterative process of taking the number 0.9 and then adding another 9 at the end of its decimal expansion. So 0.9 followed by 0.99 followed by 0.999 and so on and so on and so on. And that if we could somehow get to a way of saying, well, if we continue that process infinitely far, giant air quotes around if we continue infinitely, right? if we can somehow do that infinitely much, then the number which somehow originates out of that infinite process will be the number which we call 0.99999 repeating. And that if we can reason ourselves into that number existing, then that number will be a real number. And that's going to be our second viewpoint on where the real numbers come from. Our first viewpoint is that the reals are the least upper bounds of rational sets. And our second viewpoint is that they're going to somehow be the limits of sequences of rational numbers. And so what we need to do is somehow talk ourselves into how do we define rigorously, specifically, using the tools of analysis and using appropriate logical quantifiers and all that wonderful stuff, how are we going to define concretely what it means for a sequence to get, quote unquote, closer and closer to a limit value? So that's the conversation I want us to close with today to give us a hint as to where your next reading assignment is going to start to take you. So here's the idea. The idea is that if I start with a number 0.9, and then I add another 9 to it at the end of its decimal expansion, then I add another 9 to it, another 9 to it, and so on and so on and so on. What I'm constructing for myself is I'm constructing a sequence. And sequences are our next object of study in this course. They're going to be what we devote the next five, maybe even six weeks of our lives uh, to understanding. And so just by way of definition, uh, what a sequence of real numbers is, is it's a function. So this is kind of a weird way to think about it, but bear with me for a second. It's a function which assigns to any natural number an element of the reals. In other words, we could see it as a correspondence similar to what's up here in this data table. It says that if I take all the natural numbers, which are the numbers here in the, in the left-hand column, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so forth, I can have a correspondence that assigns a unique real number to each one of those naturals. And often what we'll do is we'll use notation like a sub 1, a sub 2, a sub 3. In place of what we might otherwise, if we were thinking about this as a regular kind of function, we would call these something like f of 1, f of 2, f of 3. But the fact that it's a function really just means that every one of the inputs that we give to this function is going to give me a unique one and only one output from this function. So a sequence is no more than a way of enumerating a countably infinitely long list of real numbers. So we have a bucket of numbers. In this case, they're the 0.9 repeating up to a certain point kind of numbers. You'll notice, by the way, that this software is actually rounding off. Um, once we get past this decimal place, it's rounding it off to one. Um, I don't like that, so I'm just going to quickly erase, because it's important for us right now not to see a distinction, or it's important for us to see a distinction between these various things. So just imagine that these are whoops, the appropriate number of nines. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and so on and so on. Um, but what the sequence is, is it's just a sequence, uh, it's a function, rather, that assigns to every natural number some element of the reals. And in this case, we actually, since we're taking the viewpoint for now that we don't know what the reals are again, maybe we'll just think of this as a function where all these outputs are actually rational. But it doesn't really matter, right? Um, what matters right now is that, uh, is that it's a sequence that every natural number gives us an, an element, the next element of the sequence. And because the natural numbers have an order to them, right, 
namely 1 is less than 2, is less than 3, is less than 4. That also gives the sequence a particular order to it, right? That 0.9 is what we call the first term of the sequence. 0.99 is the second term of the sequence. 0.999 is the third term of the sequence. And for a lot of sequences, this one included, we can come up with a nice formula which defines this sequence for us. In this case, it would be a formula that looks like this. a sub n equals 1 minus 10 to the power minus n. That's the formula that I use to come up with the, the definition, or come up with the various terms for this sequence. And so where we need to go with this is we need to come up with a way of putting onto a rigorous foundation what it would mean to take the limit of this sequence. So I'm just going to write that down using notation. And I think we all know what the <coughs> limit of this sequence is, but that's not what I'm interested in right now. What I'm interested in right now is what does the limit of a sequence mean? This is something you don't get a chance to dwell on very much when you first learn about limits in calculus, <laughs> but it's something which we must dwell upon because we can't take any sort of vague notions about getting infinitely close to something or continuing infinitely far or um, getting as close as we like. We can't take those vague notions for granted in a class where the standard of proof for us is proof and not argument, and not rhetoric, and not, well, it could be, well, it might be, well, it may be. Um, no, our proofs need to show why it must be, why the limit of the sequence must be what we say it to be. So let's get, get the is out of the way. What, what do we think the limit of this sequence, a sub n equals 1 minus 10 to the minus n, actually is? We think that this limit actually is 1. Because if you're sort of trained in the ways of calculus, you'll look at 10 to the minus n and say, well, if n is a really, really, really large number, then 10 to the minus n is going to be a really, really, really small number. And that this piece, the 10 to the minus n piece, is going to have a limit of 0 for that reason. And so therefore, the limit of this sequence is going to be 1 minus 0, and that's 1. So that's what we think the limit is. But let's take a couple minutes to think about what that limit would mean, how we could convince somebody that was true without using notions of getting arbitrarily, infinitely close, continuing on forever, that kind of stuff. So here's the idea. Um, in this graph over here, I've, I've plotted the terms of the sequence. Um, and as you might expect, the y value uh, right here is the y value 1. Uh, and the, on the x-axis, I've given us the n. So this is the first term of the sequence, this is the second term of the sequence, third term of the sequence, and so on. So here's a1, a2, a3. And so if it's true that these values are in fact getting closer and closer to 1, then what might we see on this graph? Well, the first thing we might see, so there's the number 1 on this graph, all right? the, the horizontal line at 1. And what we'd like is we'd like to be able to convince ourselves that these y values of these points, in other words, the values of the sequence, are getting very close to 1. Well, what does very close mean? Suppose that our standard for being very close is that we have to get within 0.5. We have to get within a half a unit of 1. Does the sequence look like it does that? Well, it looks like it does, because if I... Let me decorate this picture just a little bit, and this is where we're going to end up for today. Because if I go one half of a unit on either side of 1, so if I go up to 1.5 and I go down to 0 0.5, what that does is it creates for me a little interval on the y-axis. I'll shade it in, this little interval right here. And the radius of that interval is 0.5. And it looks as though it's true that the interval with a radius of 0.5 on the y-axis is an interval where this sequence of points enters that interval and it never leaves. Right? At some point, um, the terms of the sequence get that close and they stay that close to the number 1 for 0.5 being the radius of my interval. But what if 0.5 isn't close enough? What if we want to get even closer? Let's say I want to get within 0.05 instead. Is it true that the terms of the sequence eventually get within that distance? It looks like it is true, but that the first term of the sequence actually doesn't get there. The first term of the sequence is not within 0.05 of the number 1, but the second term is, 
And indeed, the third term is, and the fourth term is, and all the terms after it are, but the first one is not. And yet, somehow, that's still got to be OK. So what the definition of convergence for a sequence has to do is it has to give us a notion of closeness that's going to work no matter how close that we want to get. No matter how I set the radius of this interval, and the radius of this interval, by the way, because it's a number which can be as small as we like, is often called epsilon in the definition. Epsilon, the radius of this interval, what needs to be true is that no matter how small, and this is where we'll end up here, no matter how small epsilon is, the terms of the sequence, and when I say terms, I mean the, the y values of these points, right, the values of the a sub n's, the terms must get to and stay within epsilon of the limit. And that's the intuitive notion of what the definition of convergence is. But you can already see, perhaps, the breadcrumbs of some logical <laughs> quantifiers, no matter how small, um, get and stay within epsilon. That's, that's an argument for using an absolute value to measure a distance, right? So a lot of the elements of logic and also the elements of the metrics of the real number line that we talked about at the end of our last chapter, um, those are all ingredients that we're going to need in order to finish this definition. And that's where we're going to pick up with this when we resume on Wednesday.